I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Joe. Digital. Maserati Rick in Detroit, D. convertible bird in Miami, Miami graduated summa cum laude, strip club made a tsunami, Carlton Hines with the ball game, Rayful Edmonds with the snowflakes, Craig Pettis in the M-Town, Sal Magluta with the boat game, Falcone with the cocaine, like Freeway Ricky with the plug game, like Monster Cody in South Central, Larry Davis from my nigga Tilly Hank, then, you hear me, you know what I'm saying, one of the realest niggas in the city, you know what I'm saying, they, they hating on him right now, you know what I'm saying, you think got him all over the news and shit, you know what I'm saying? Witnesses coming up dead and shit. Man in jail. You know what I'm saying? He posted a million dollar burn. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to give a nigga another bond because he knew the man could make the bond. You know what I'm saying? That's it. Morning. You know what it is, baby. You It's all good in the hood. You know what I'm ever heard the BG song, Guilty by Association, where he said, I keep them goonies around. They keep them toolies around. Niggas getting hit 50 times if my nigga Mooney around. It is rumored that the feds wanted to play that song at the Telly Hankton murder trial. Another member of what police call a notorious crime family is behind bars. Sidney Hankton was arrested for illegal possession of stolen things. Sources tell WDSU Sidney is being kept away from his cousin Telly because investigators want to make sure he doesn't share any information regarding the trial or the jury that was just set with Telly. In the past, we've reported on witness intimidation in connection to the Telly Hankton case. Telly Hankton is on trial, accused of a revenge killing in 2008. Now, before we go any further, I know y'all asking yourself, who the fuck is Telly Hankton? Well, he's only the nigga that the New Orleans police deemed the baddest and most dangerous nigga walking the streets at that time. He was serving time for what police called a revenge murder that happened at a lounge called Jazz Daiquiri's that would pop up later on in the story. We can't let a street, uh, a rich, powerful street thug intimidate the whole justice system. The district attorney's office will retry the man once called the most dangerous criminal in New Orleans, but experts say the case sets a bad precedent. The trial for Telly Hankton, the man once said to be part of a notorious crime family, ended in a hung jury, and a criminologist says this case could have a ripple in, a ripple effect on the criminal justice system. WDSU reporter Simney Chew and it's tonight's big local story. Simney? Scott, experts worry that this hung jury could set a negative tone for any future convictions. This is a chilling outcome. After two days of testimony, a jury could not reach a verdict in the murder trial of Telly Hankton. Tulane criminologist Peter Scharf says this is not an average murder trial, considering the 35-year-old Hankton is also described as a powerful drug lord and hitman in uptown New Orleans. He's a guy who shoots people in the face, runs you over and shoots you in the face. He's a million-dollar bail and has the best lawyer in the city. Prosecutors say he killed Darnell Stewart in May of 2008, chasing him down on South Claiborne and then shooting him several times, all as revenge for a cousin's death. The DA's office introduced surveillance video provided by a daiquiri shop that caught the gruesome murder on tape and an eyewitness who testified to the killing. But a defense witness provided Hankton an alibi, testifying she and Hankton were having drinks at the W Hotel at the time of the murder. This is fear city. Uh, fear got worse is all you can say. And that uh, they, this is a case you cannot lose. But in a city plagued with violent crime where witnesses are afraid to come forward, and in this case, the eyewitness even had to be escorted out of the judge's chambers after his testimony, Sharp worries this hung jury could implicate other cases. This is violence with a lot of resources. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that there are risks. No one wants to be a dead hero in these kind of cases and that's tragically a possibility in these kind of cases. Hankton is set to stand trial in September for the June 2009 killing of Jesse Reed, which prosecutors say was also a revenge killing. Hassan Williams, an eyewitness to that murder, was killed two weeks later. Police say the same gun was used in both deaths. Hankton was behind bars at the time. Scott? Well, despite the up upset in this case, the district attorney says his office landed eight other murder convictions in the past week. Leon Canizero released a statement saying, quote, with all the attention given to certain high-profile cases, it is easy to lose sight of the fact that my ADAs are in court on a daily basis prosecuting violent criminals. While it is sad that the amount of violence in the city has left us with so much work, the citizens should be confident that we are answering the call.
Now everybody like, how he don't get found guilty or it's a mistrial if they got him on tape and they got an eyewitness? Um, well, they can't convict you if he wasn't there during the time of the crime. It's WDSU News at 5. Late this afternoon in Orleans Parish, grand jury indicted two witnesses in a high-profile murder case on perjury charges. And today we learned one woman confessed that she got cash in exchange for coming up with an alibi for the man once considered the city's most dangerous criminal. Those are the latest twists for the two women at the center of Telly Hankton's trial for murder. WDSU reporter Gina Swanson breaks down these new developments. Gina? Two witnesses charged with almost two dozen counts of perjury in connection to the Telly Hankton murder trial. Thursday afternoon, a grand jury indicted Danielle Hampton on 20 counts and Santa Johnson on three counts of lying to create an alibi for Hankton. According to court records, the witnesses may have even been paid for their testimony. Today what we're looking at is a new wrinkle in, in the system in that these people are saying that they were paid to co collaborate, corrupt, information and therefore which undermines the very fabric of the criminal justice system and bring it to a new kind of low if we permit this to continue. It's a case that dates back to May of 2008. Hankton is accused of killing a man to avenge the death of a family member. But during trial, Danielle Hampton testified she was having drinks with Hankton that night. It's a story Santa Johnson supported when she also took the stand. The trial ended with a hung jury, a mistrial. But criminal justice experts say this case is far from over. It has the making of greater and deeper and wider and broader implication for the criminal justice system as well as the community. If money did change hands in exchange for testimony, it raises even more questions like how much was it and who arranged it? Concerns that experts say are serious enough to get other agencies involved. It certainly borders on the, a uh, lever that could bring it to federal scrutiny. Now, in response to the indictment, the DA said in part, quote, I will show the people of New Orleans that those who attempt to molest the process will be brought to justice, and the justice will be both swift and severe. Camille. And we should also add, Gina, that Johnson was arrested on perjury charges and was set to be released on her own recognizance until the indictment was handed up this afternoon. An arrest warrant has been issued for Hampton. Bond for both women has been set at $300,000. A new twist in the murder case involving a man who at one time was called the city's most dangerous criminal. A second witness was taken into custody accused of perjuring herself during the murder trial of Telly Hankton. WDSU reporter Gina Swanson joins us now live from the News Center with more on this. Gina? That's right, Scott, but we should say new information just into the newsroom. In the last few minutes, we have learned that both uh, Danielle Hampton and Santa Johnson have been indicted on a 23-count indictment on charges of perjury. We know that Santa Johnson uh, was the one who actually was arrested yesterday and the second witness in connection with this case, but this just in, they have been indicted by a grand jury this afternoon on uh, 23 counts of perjury, and they're both bond for both has been set at $300,000, so this case is constantly evolving. Now, you know, after you try to people like that, they're going to come back for you with a vengeance, but the one thing I learned about Telly Hankton and the people around him was they wasn't going to fold for shit. Let's do round two. The man once considered New Orleans' most dangerous criminal is back in court. Telly Hankton's retrial started this morning at criminal court. Hankton is accused of killing Darnell Stewart in May of 2008. The first trial ended in a hung jury in July. WDSU reporter Gina Swanson is live at criminal court with details from today's proceedings. Gina? That's right, Scott. Jury selection is underway. We do understand uh, at last check that they've selected just about seven jurors so far. Five more to go to get to the panel of 12. We do know that 50 potential jurors were answering questions all day in court this morning, and most of the questions focused on all of the media coverage surrounding this case. As you mentioned, Telly Hankton at one point was called the city's most dangerous criminal, so the, his defense attorney wanted to find out exactly what the potential jurors knew about the case or what they thought of Telly Hankton. Now, all of this stems from the 2008 killing of Darnell Stewart. That happened on South Claiborne outside of a daiquiri shop. Police say Hankton and another man actually ran Stewart down in a car. Then Hankton got out and fired several shots. Now, we should also mention that some of the people uh, in the jury pool today asked to be excused from the case because they said that they didn't feel comfortable. One man said that he lives in the uptown area and he 
knows that Hankton's family lives in the uptown area as well, so it just made him uh, feel uncomfortable about serving on this jury. Scott. Gina, what about the recent perjury cases involving Telly Hankton? Absolutely, Scott. We know the trial in July ended in a hung jury after witnesses created an alibi for Hankton on the night of, of, of Stewart's murder. After that case, this is something that the DA had vowed to retry, and he did say that those witnesses lied on the stand in exchange for cash. So not only is Hankton being retried, the DA does plan to prosecute uh, those witnesses who he says perjured themselves on the stand as well. That's the very latest for now. We're on your side at Criminal. Criminal Court. I'm Gina Swanson. Scott, back to you. All right, Gina, thanks. thanks. And there Other... was some drama outside Criminal Court yesterday when a family member of Telly Hankton posed as a juror and tried to sneak inside the courthouse. WDSU reporter Travers Mackle picks up our team coverage with that story. Travers? Yes, Scott, an uncommon turn of events for a case that's not your run of the mill murder trial. The DA's office says a relative of Telly Hankton tried to sneak into the courthouse posing as a juror and using a side entrance. All jurors have their own entrance into the courthouse at Tulane and Broad. It's this door you're looking at on the Broad Street side. The woman who allegedly tried to sneak in is identified as LaToya Emery. She was asked to leave criminal court earlier this week for making what some believe to be gestures to the jury during the Hankton trial. That woman's picture was given to security guards at the court's front entrance. So the DA's office says she tried to pose as a juror and gain access to the courthouse through the side door. A lot of the stuff that happens here at Tulane and Broad, you can't make up. People will not believe that it happens, but it happens. They um, tell her that she can't go in the courtroom, but because of some problems she's had, then she comes in and tries to go through the jury side of it, and she's got some issues. The woman, LaToya Emery, faces at least one municipal misdemeanor charge at this time. Scott? All right, Travers, thanks. And once again, the jury is deliberating at this hour. And as you heard Gina say a moment ago, the judge told them to get ready for a potentially long night. We have a crew at the courthouse and we'll continue to follow this case until a verdict is reached. Remember I told you it wasn't going to be no folding? Telly done took him to trial and shook him once. Everybody was expecting him to shake him again. Now, you may remember Hankton's first trial ended with a hung jury and a mistrial was later declared. This was back in July. Two women provided alibi testimony and they were later arrested for perjury. Well, this time around, there were no alibi witnesses and it took the jury about three and a half hours to deliberate, convicting Hankton 10 to 2. After three days of testimony, the jury handed down a guilty verdict in the murder trial of Telly Hankton for the May 2008 murder of Darnell Stewart. I believe that he is not guilty. How are you feeling right now? Just that God is a God of life. He gives it and he only one could take it. This woman identified herself only as a Hankton relative. Meanwhile, the prosecutors who secured a conviction against the man once called the most dangerous criminal in New Orleans had no comment. Instead, District Attorney Leon Canazero says his office is gratified by the verdict, but says there is still much more work to do. Several years now and there's still a lot of violence that's going on in this community. So his removal from that uptown area has really not stopped the violence. We're going to take him off the streets for the rest of his life, but there are other people out there. Legal analyst Robert Jenkins says the turning point of the trial likely came during emotional eyewitness testimony in which one man tearfully recounted seeing Hankton shoot Stewart at least 10 times outside of the Jazz Daiquiri Lounge on South Claiborne. But also, as you remember, the defense does not have to do anything. They don't have to put on a defense. But in this particular case, there was really a, not much to the defense that they could put on because you had two eyewitnesses. One was 97 percent. The other one was saying he was right on. And the state took their time and put on a very good case. Meanwhile, Canazero says this conviction is not the end as his office still has 200 murder cases to try. We're going to go out and we're going to continue to work. If you go out and commit a violent act, we're going to go after you. And we're going to go after you as aggressively as we can because this has got to stop. Now, this verdict came down amid much drama outside of the courtroom. The DA's office says a family member of Telly Hankton tried to pose as a juror and sneak into the courtroom just yesterday. The same woman, according to the DA's office, also was taken out of the courtroom for allegedly making hand gestures to the jury. She faces at least one municipal misdemeanor charge at this time. On your side, live at Criminal Court, Simney Chuan, WDSU News. All right, Simney, we heard the DA say that he will be off the streets for the rest of his life, when will Hankton actually be sentenced here? 
Sentencing scheduled to take place on Thursday. He receives a mandatory life sentence as is under Louisiana state law for a second degree murder charge. However, his defense attorney, Robert Glass, says he vows to appeal this verdict. But the legal analyst we spoke to tonight, Robert Jenkins, says he thinks that uh, this verdict will stand on appeal. All right, 72 and live at criminal court. Thanks. Hankton is also set to stand trial in September for the June 2009 murder of Jesse Reed, which prosecutors One say of the was city's also most dangerous or criminals is scheduled to hear his fate today. So let's go now to WDSU reporter Rosa Flores, who is live at criminal court for us with the latest on Telly Hankton's sentencing. Good morning, Rosa. Oh, Randy, good morning. You know, there's been a lot of drama around this trial. First of all, uh, one of Hankton's relatives was charged with a misdemeanor for posing as a juror to get access to the courthouse. And then you've got uh, local leaders weighing in and saying he is one of the most dangerous criminals in New Orleans history. Now, Hankton uh, was convicted of second degree murder in the death of Darnell Stewart. We talked to our WDSU analysts and they say that the turning point for this case was when an eyewitness witness went, went uh, before the jurors took the stand and described Hankton shooting Stewart at least 10 times. Now again, a lot of um, local leaders weighing in uh, after this conviction. Take a look at your screen because this is a quote from uh, Chief Surpass. He says something along the lines of, quote, New Orleans is safer because Hankton is off the street. The sentencing phase for Hankton for his trial is set for today at 2 p.m. That's latest here from Criminal Court. I'm Rosa Flores for WDSU News. Randy, back to you. Thank you, Rosa. And Hankton's sentencing was originally scheduled for last week, but Hankton and his attorney, well, they showed up and they asked for a new trial. That request was denied, and the defense asked for a continuance of that sentencing for the today. The man convicted in a 2008 murder begins his prison sentence. Telly Hankton, once dubbed one of the city's most dangerous criminals, was sentenced earlier today. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Hankton was convicted of murdering Darnell Stewart outside of a bar on South Claiborne. Now that the NOPD finally got telly, you would think that everything would be all over. Nope, not so easy. It don't work like that. A man once described as one of New Orleans' most dangerous criminals is now the center of a federal indictment. But the feds didn't stop with 36-year-old Telly Hankton. Twelve of his family members and alleged associates were charged today in connection with a violent drug ring. WDSU reporter Gina Swanson is live in our studio for the breakdown of the charges. Gina. Norman, this 22-count indictment has charges that range from money laundering to murder. We went to the neighborhood where the Hankins live to get reaction from the family to today's charges. In the 1900 block of Josephine Street, just about everyone is family. The Hankton family, labeled by law enforcement as a violent drug trafficking organization, but Hankton family members and neighbors say that characterization is both unfair and untrue. Don't listen to everything the media has to see, because the media don't know. If you was around these, around the Hankton family, you would know them, and it's, everything he is not the truth. Still, in an early morning sweep, federal agents rounded up Shirley Hankton and others related to or associated with the family. Shirley Hankton is a wonderful woman, a wonderful grandmother. In all, 13 people have been named in this federal indictment with charges ranging from conspiracy and money laundering to drug dealing and murder. The government says Telly Hankton is the leader of the group. Investigators allege the criminal activity dates back more than 15 years, spans two states, and includes four killings, two of which happened here at the Jazz Dacry Lounge on Claiborne. It looks like they, they've done their homework because when you read it, they just didn't make the stuff. They got people, they probably got wiretaps alleging all of this, so it's going to be pretty difficult on the defense in a case like this. The government claims the organization frequently purchased and sold crack cocaine, heroin, and marijuana and used fear, intimidation, and violence to carry out the criminal activity. But back in the 1900 block of Josephine Street, Hankton relatives say the reputation associated with the family is inescapable. But for this mother, she says no one will ever know what it's like to raise a teenage son in the city with the last name Hankton. And the officer told him he won't make it to C-21. How could you characterize my child like that? Now, we should also mention that five of the, of the defendants in this case are named in the murder charges. It's not clear at this point whether or not the government will seek the death penalty in this case, Norman. All right, Gina, this is a superseding indictment on top of state charges already filed. Meanwhile, U.S. Attorney Jim Letton weighed in on today's indictments with the following statement, quote, 
Today, as a result of the outstanding work of the men and women of federal law enforcement and our partners in the New Orleans Police Department and the District Attorney's Office, yet another powerful blow has been made against an organization whose members are alleged to have committed murder and violence against our community. Now you know when the feds come, they ain't playing, and they don't want just you. They want everybody that they think was down. So they snatched up several of Telly's family members, including his mother, and his cousin Troy, who once was recruited by Nick Saban to play football for the LSU Tigers. It's after one of the city's most high-profile murders. Federal investigators say police arrested the wrong guy. Michael Anderson was accused of shooting five teens in Central City back in 2006. But federal prosecutors say he was not the one responsible. And instead, they're pointing the finger at Telly Hankton, a man who's been called the crime boss of New Orleans. WDSU News reporter Travis Mackle is here with what this means for Anderson, who was first charged for this. Well, most likely nothing because his convictions were vacated years ago. But the fact the feds now say Hankton is the trigger man could prove detrimental at his upcoming murder trial. On this quiet Central City street corner today, no one wanted to talk about the killing that happened almost a decade ago. It's always been rumored that reputed crime boss Telly Hankton could be involved, and now the feds believe that's true. In a federal filing before Hankton's June murder trial in federal court, the feds say they believe he pulled the trigger on an assault rifle, killing five teens. Prosecutors want to use that information against Hankton, even though he's never been charged with the murders. Legal analyst Robert Jenkins. Uh, the people within the criminal justice community had all, always heard that he committed those crimes. There was rumors out there. It was even brought up in Michael Anderson's case that he had done this. It was dubbed the Central City Massacre. Five teens gunned down at the corner of Josephine and Daniil in June of 2006. The killings prompted then-Governor Kathleen Blanco to send the National Guard back to the city. Within days, Michael Anderson was arrested and later convicted of the killings and sentenced to death. That conviction was later vacated due to problems with how prosecutors handled the case. Anderson, a drug gang leader, later pleaded guilty to another unrelated murder and drug charges and is currently serving a life sentence. Back in 2011, Anderson's lawyer said his client did not shoot anyone in Central City. Hankton's lawyers do not want the new allegations from prosecutors mentioned at his June trial. They cannot discuss the matter as there's a gag order in place in this case. Hankton was deemed New Orleans' most dangerous criminal by Mayor Mitch Landrieu and Police Chief Ronald Surpass back in 2011, running an alleged drug ring through Central City. The jury began deliberating in this case on Friday and handed down a verdict around 2 o'clock this afternoon. Now, Telly Hankton was charged with nearly a dozen racketeering charges, and he was found guilty on nine of those charges. Those guilty verdicts were handed down on three charges of murder and eight of racketeering, also three charges of causing death through the use of a firearm. He's also guilty on other conspiracy charges. Now, Hankton and four other defendants pleaded not guilty to charges that they were part of an operation that started trafficking drugs in the mid-90s, which led to violence and murder. Hankton is already serving a life sentence on a state murder charge for killing Darnell Stewart. He was charged in federal court with murder in aid of racketeering and Stewart's 2008 death and the murder of Darvin Bessie and Jesse Reed. Now, one of the cases in the trial centered around the killing of five teens in Central City back in 2006. Prosecutors claim that Hankton was the gunman who killed those teens. On trial with Hankton was also alleged gunman Walter Porter and two of Hankton's cousins, Andre Hankton and Kevin Jackson. Now, Hankton's mother, Shirley, also pleaded guilty to racketeering charges back in May. Reporting at Federal Court, I'm Casey Ferran. Back to you. Damn. You would think after all of that, the shit would be said and done. Nah. Not really. This shit just getting started. Police are investigating a brutal uptown murder that could be linked to the city's most dangerous criminal. We're talking about Telly Hankton. WDSU reporter Simney Chuan is live where that murder happened on South Claiborne Avenue. And Simney, what are the details that you have today? 
Camille, 61 year old Curtis Matthews was gunned down in front of the Jazz Daiquiri Lounge on Saturday night. He suffered multiple gunshot wounds and died at the scene. We have learned that he is the brother of John Matthews, who testified against Telly Hankton at his last trial. He testified that he was 95 to 97 percent sure that it was indeed Hankton who gunned down Darnell Stewart in front of the Jazz Daiquiri Lounge back in 2008. We've heard from District Attorney Leon Canizero, and he says that uh, his department held an interagency meeting with other uh, law enforcement agencies, including NOPD and FBI, just to name a couple. And he says that they are aggressively pursuing all leads and leaving no stone unturned in this investigation, but they still have not determined a motive and whether this is indeed linked to Telly Hankton. Camille? You know, Simney, this entire situation begs the, the question, should or even could the victim have been better protected? Well, first of all, we should probably note that witness protection, as most people understand, uh, and at the federal level, is when people get these new identities and they are relocated out of state. Well, what happens here at the state level is something very different. Uh, witnesses are protected in the days leading up to the trial, and uh, they're given re resources so that they can uh, either have moving costs or hotel rooms, something to make them feel safer during testimony. But we've got to remember that Curtis Matthews was neither a victim nor witness. He was a brother, and according to District Attorney Leon Canizero, he says he doesn't know of any single agency that is tacked with protecting an extended family member who lives out of state. Now, coming up at 5 and 6 o'clock tonight, we do hear from Rafael Goyaneci of the Metropolitan Crime Commission. He says this is one of the most atypical cases he's ever seen, but hear what he thinks law enforcement needs to do from this point forward. All right, Simney, uh, stand by. We'll see you again in about an there hour. There are Scott. serious questions tonight surrounding the district attorney's office. This is witness protection system. This after a man whose brother testified in a high-profile murder case was killed Saturday night. It's a story we first broke earlier today on WDSU.com. The victim's brother testified in the murder trial of Telly Hankton, also known as one of the most dangerous men in New Orleans. WDSU reporter Tiffany Bradley is on your side with what this killing could mean for the future of murder investigation. Investigations. That's tonight's big local story. New Orleans police have confirmed that a 61 year old man shot to death outside of this Jazz Daiquiri and Lounge on Claiborne Avenue Saturday night is indeed the brother of a man who was a key witness in the Telly Hankton trial last month. A brutal uptown murder could be linked to the city's most dangerous criminal who's now behind bars. Curtis Matthews, the co owner of this daiquiri shop, was gunned down in front of his business Saturday night. Neighbors didn't seem surprised over the killing. That's not the first time that I've heard Mama. of shootings and stuff like Mama. that. But this shooting comes days after a high profile criminal, Telly Hankton, was sentenced to life in prison for murder. Curtis Matthews was the brother of the man who helped put Hankton behind bars. Back in September, John Matthews testified he was almost certain Hankton shot and killed Darnell Stewart in front of his daiquiri shop in May 2008. They can't uh, get you to get your wife to get your kid. Criminologist Peter Scharf says the recent homicide is a huge blow to the criminal justice system. How are all these great people in the DA's witness victim witness protection witness assistance program going to convince people to testify against organized drug interests? A spokesperson with the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office says they can't comment on protection procedures for witnesses. Meantime, Hankton is awaiting trial on a second murder charge. Scharf says most of the city's murders are drug related, and with an average of 15 murders a month, Scharf says those crimes will go unsolved if witnesses are free to talk. If they can get away with killing witnesses who oppose the drug interests, this is going to be a sad city, and we're in for a very rough ride. So far, police have not arrested anyone in connection with Saturday night's murder. On your side, Uptown, Tiffany Bradley, WDSU News. And the man who testified in the Hankton case, John Matthews, was shot 17 times last October. Police believe it was an attempt to stop Matthews from testifying in the As Hankton trial. As we speak, trial. the NOPD is set to make a major announcement involving a high-profile murder case, a case that has the entire metro area buzzing for the past several days. Curtis Matthews, you'll remember, was shot and killed in front of the Jazz Daiquiri Lounge on Claiborne. He was the brother of a witness 
in the Telly Hankton murder trial. This is a live look at NOPD headquarters right now. That news conference set to begin any second. WDSU reporter Simney Chewett is standing by for us to wrap things up at the news conference's conclusion. But we expect Police Chief Ronald Surpass to step to that podium in the next couple of seconds. And Scott, we suspect, we don't know, but we suspect they have made an arrest in the, the murder of Curtis Matthews, the brother of the witness who test, whose testimony help send Telly Hankton to prison for life. You're looking at a live picture of the uh, chief of police of the New Orleans Police Department who's uh, walking to the podium right now, ready to begin his news conference. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. As you know, this police department has been focusing its resources untiring since last Saturday night with an around-the-clock effort to put a name and a face with the man who shot and killed Curtis Matthews last Saturday night. I am pleased to say tonight that because of the help of so many New Orleanians, so many New Orleanians, we have done just that. We have issued an arrest this evening for Walter Porter, an African American male, 31 years old, 6 foot 3, weighing 170 pounds. An arrest warrant has been issued for his arrest, at calling him into responsibility for the second degree murder of Walter Porter. Tonight, less than an hour ago, our special weapons and tactics team and homicide detectives served a search warrant on Porter's house based upon the voluminous information we have received from the public. We believe there may be evidence in this search and we will know more in the coming hours. Once again, the drive through doors of justice in New Orleans tell us the sad story. Porter has an extensive, extensive arrest and conviction history for violent crimes to include crimes such as burglary, illegal weapons, simple battery, damage to property, putting officers' lives in danger, and convictions for assault, aggravated battery, distribution of marijuana, and felon in possession of a firearm. It's very important that our community know that we are grateful for the continued assistance, untiring assistance, of the district attorney's office, the federal law enforcement officers, and the state law enforcement officers who have worked with us every day on this case. But I got to make the point perfectly clear. What Mr. Porter don't know is who's talking. And what we know is a lot of people are talking. What Mr. Porter don't know is who's going to be the one to call us tonight and say where he's laying his head down as he's running from his crime. What Mr. Porter will never know is that tonight the people of New Orleans said un. With, with, with no doubt, we will talk, we will share, and we will let you know where Mr. Porter is. So rest assured that we will not rest until Mr. Porter is arrested and brought to justice for these crimes. I am incredibly proud of the men and women of the police department, particularly our homicide detectives under the leadership of Chief Boyalis, Commander Noel, and Lieutenant Marchese, who have nonstop worked this case since Saturday. Any questions? Do we have reason to believe that Mr. Porter We do believe that there is a relationship between Mr. Porter and members of the Hankton family. The depth of that relationship needs to continue to be investigated. But we also know that the people of New Orleans have a relationship with this police department, and they are the ones who told us so much information about Porter. Are you opening a motive? What's being done to keep witnesses and their family safe? That's the best question tonight. This is what's keeping people safe. What makes a community safe is when it stands up with its numbers of 343,000 people and says, we have had enough. We have had enough. I can't stress this point enough. We have received so much information from the public, so much information from the public. Porter has no idea who's calling us. We know who's calling us, and we're not going to defend him, and we are not going to make them get in harm's way because we have so many people calling. It doesn't have to come to that. This continues to be considered by our investigations. We do not rule any theories out. We want to make sure that we look at this holistically in partnership with our district attorney and his wonderful staff who've worked so hard with us on this case. At this point, are you able to say whether you'll leave it to retaliation killing for the conviction of Kelly Hankton? I think right now it's far too soon, but it's also far obvious that the connectivity of here cannot be ignored. We don't know the depth of it yet, and we don't know all the facts that we can or can't prove, but the connectivity does strike the question of what relationship existed, and that's what we're going to get to the bottom of. Can you comment on any threats made to the district attorney and his family, also police protection that we found outside the mayor's home tonight, his parents' home, and also the district attorney's 
It's standard practice in our business to not comment on security measures and security packages of personnel who we work with, and I'm not going to be at liberty to do so today. We won't def uh, confirm or deny either. Do you think Porter is still in New Orleans? I have every reason to believe that Mr. Porter has a lot of his friends watching TV tonight, and they don't know which one's going to call us and tell us where he is, but somebody's going to call us and tell us where Porter is. Now, I think it's important, again, that we don't confirm or deny any of the security packages that we work, and, and I'll continue to be able to say just that. Do you think others in the city could be targeted, uh, other citizens, detectives perhaps, in the police department could perhaps be targeted by this family? You know, one of the reasons being a police officer is such a professional and noble cause is because this goes on every day. We arrest dangerous people in this community every single day. Porter is just one of the many in any city in America. So no, we don't, we don't let ourselves focus on that too much. We're smart, we make sure we do good jobs, but we're not going to let ourselves be distracted by that. Why are you naming him? Because we got a warrant for him about two and a half hours ago. A warrant for his arrest. Are you concerned that by naming him, you're going to send him behind No, not at all, because the point I made a few minutes ago is that we have received so much information from the people in the city of New Orleans he has no idea who's been talking to us. Kelly Hinton has been called by the police department one of the most dangerous men in New Orleans. Do you think he's communicating from inside his cell? How is, how is this witness, this, uh, the brother of, of the witness, you know, how is this whole thing kind of happening if he's locked up? We still need to investigate so many things. My predecessor and our predecessor administration of police called him the most dangerous man in New Orleans. I have no reason to believe that that was hyperbole. I have no reason to believe that they didn't have good cause to think so. But tonight is the night to say the truth. Simple truth, plain fact. The people of New Orleans have responded, overwhelmingly have responded that they have had enough. This is how we turn the tide. This is how we protect witnesses. This is how we protect our community. This is how we make New Orleans the great city that Mayor Landrieu and I have committed to making this city be. I've heard that task forces have been created in light of what has happened. Can you talk a little bit more about that? We have such a interconnectivity with our local, state, and federal partners that in this particular case, we've gotten assistance from the Louisiana State Police, Colonel Edmondson's team. We've gotten assistance from the FBI, the ATF, the DEA. We've gotten daily work partnership and assistance with the district attorney's office. Now, be sure, though, that we do that every day on all types of cases, that this wasn't newly created as a result of the Curtis Matthews case, but it shows that we are already so much lockstep in working together, we shifted resources on this case on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and now here we are Thursday night. I know that any murder is obviously egregious in this community, but it seems as if this one has offended uh, city leaders a little bit more than most, kind of going back to the Crime Stoppers press conference held a couple of days ago. Would you say that it, it had a chilling effect or potentially chilling effect on the community if the case wasn't solved? Now, there, there are times when a mayor, like Mayor Landrieu did the other day, the district attorney, myself, the sheriff, and so many others come to the community and say, we understand, we hear, we know that people are concerned. And we have a responsibility as public leaders to ensure that that concern is met with a professional, thorough, non-ending response. So that's what was uh, really the important message, is that every murder is a tragic loss to a family in our community. But Curtis Matthews is a man with a family. And he, like the other victims of murder this year, deserve to know that we're going to do everything and anything we can within our power to bring those to justice who commit the crime. And then more importantly, with so much work that Mayor Landrieu is doing and we're doing with strategic command and looking at the bigger issues of how to stop murder as a community holistically. We have no idea if it is or it isn't. We continue to investigate any and all leads on that case. Again, Crime Stoppers is your method. What makes this so exciting for us tonight to be able to name a suspect is that people came to us, and some people came to us through Crime Stoppers, and when you put the two together, you have an you have a overarching amount of information coming in for our detectives to work with. We'd ask for the same thing with the pickup truck. We'd ask for the same thing. People who know something, get in touch with us through Crime Stoppers if you have a reason to be concerned for your safety, or you want to use Crime Stoppers, or call us directly. Either way. Thank you very much. The police chief of New Orleans with a major announcement tonight. Make no mistake about it, folks. This is a significant development.
a suspect has been named in the murder of Curtis Matthews. That suspect is Walter Porter. The police chief describes him as a man with an extensive arrest and conviction history for violent crime in New Orleans. He credits the people of New Orleans with the assist in this particular um, suspect. Uh, in so many words, the chief of police is saying that the people of New Orleans are undeterred by threats of violence uh, and intimidation.